Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Nikon news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here and here is... Are you real? I'm real. This is Becky. She is back. I'm here. All right. How's it going, Becky? How are you feeling? Uh, a little bit jet lagged, but otherwise yeah. good. Yes. So what do you mean you're very energized and ready for this energy to bring it to the podcast? Definitely. All right. Let's move on to the news then. First one up is, well, we actually have two weeks of news. Yes. So, so it's a bumper edition. Absolutely. The good news is nothing major, really. So I think there are about two bits of news that we're going to discuss. First one up is 800 mil, according to Nikon Rumors, will be announced on 4th of April. And a couple of tidbits that we have that it's definitely going to be lower than three kilos. And it's also going to be cheaper than a 5.6 Canon version because it will be phase Fresnel lens. Yes. Now, we've seen pictures of this lens actually at CP+. Plus, so we knew that it was in development already. But if the, the rumors are to be believed, then hopefully we'll see it in the next few weeks in the flesh yeah you're gonna give it five stars out of five uh, i hope so fantastic well fingers crossed next up two new nikon cameras have been registered online in japan the japanese website digicam info it reported that nikon has registered several new products online including two new cameras these are rather cryptically called N2120 and N2121. The latter of the two is supposedly a digital camera with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Nikon also registered a memory card called N2123. Fantastic. It's really strange to me that uh, there's one camera that doesn't have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in this day and age and one has them. I wonder if it's the same camera with the different dongles or it could be completely two different things. I mean, you can have an entry-level one which technically should have some sort of Wi-Fi compatibility because you want to connect your entry-level camera to your phone, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's kind of the main aim for it. And then the second one could potentially is at eight. <laughs> Just keep telling yourself that, Con. Um, now, Nikon have already had XQD branded memory cards in the past, so it could be that Nikon are bringing out their own CF Express card potentially, or... I can't see any reason for them having an SD card particularly. Mm. So that's that's the only logical thing. What do you reckon? That's true. We saw, we saw some Nikon SD cards in the past. I mean, we knew that they technically are not made by Nikon. They're effectively made by some other manufacturers with, and carry the Nikon label on them. Mm. So who knows? They might have some Delkin Black inside. That would be nice. Yeah, or could be some Angel Bird. <laughs> yes, true. Very, very true. Hopefully not Alexa. <laughs> Good. All right, the next one up comes from Petapixel, Digicam Info, and also ip Force Japanese website. It's called Nikon Designs a Sensor that has both global mm. and rolling shutter. Right. So apparently Nikon have filed a patent for a new type of sensor that would allow it to perform both a rolling and global shutter operation. Nikon appears interested in creating a sensor that can provide photographers and videographers the best of both worlds by providing one sensor that can basically do both. The patent was filed in December 2021 and recently spotted by Digicam Info. All right, Becky, let's talk about rolling shutter versus global shutter. Okay. So rolling shutter is the standard shutter that we have currently in all our digital cameras. So it effectively records the subject from the top to the bottom. Yeah. The problem with that, and especially with early cameras that recorded video, something like D90 or 5D Mark II, because you're recording from top to the bottom, if you move in, if you're recording a video of a moving subject, you may get a bit of a jelly effect. So either a passing train or let's say stick will be moving like this. So imagine the pencil. Mm -hmm. And if you move it like this, you can see an illusion. Thank you. So yes. the global charts record everything at the same time. That's the benefit of this. So for video work, it's definitely better. The problem with the global charts are that you potentially could get more noise and they're also a lot more expensive to produce as well. So therefore, having both of those in the camera might be quite useful. And you can supposedly design a sensor like this. What do you think they'll put it in? Well, the good question is, remember we, when we discussed a sensor that was supposed to be amazing in low light, mm. and then soon after we found out that it was designed for industrial applications. Mm. So who knows, maybe, maybe it will be this case. Maybe it will be designed in the future consumer products. And generally, if when we talked about the future of photographic industry and videography, Global Shots is the way to go, really. Yes. So in terms of this, having the best of both worlds is definitely a nice thing to have. I don't think it will happen very soon. I don't think we'll see it next year. Maybe we'll start to see the first cameras. Yes. But I think it might take another three to four years to fully develop. I can understand that. Good. I wonder if by producing the two in one camera or creating a hybrid, if it will somehow reduce manufacturing costs, if it's like limited to one particular purpose, such as video. Mm -hmm. But I don't see how that would be. Yeah, it sounds to me that if that 
would materialize in a product that will be a flagship product. Yeah. So something will come out maybe after that. Now, now if you're talking like maybe, th maybe three, four years down the road anyway, yeah. then yes, we definitely is going to be something like Z9 Mark II or something like that. So it could be a proper video camera as well. I mean, there's definitely a demand for professional video camera from Nikon. Yes. At least people who shoot videos nowadays, they definitely want Nikon to release one. So who knows, maybe it will go there as well. Great. Next up, Nikon released a new firmware update version 1.03 for the D780. What did they fix, Becky? <laughs> they fixed an issue that resulted in live view being over or underexposed when the exposure was, in fact, correctly adjusted. This would occur during live view when non-CPU lenses were mounted on the camera with very specific settings mm. in place. So, for example, having exposure preview on the mode dial rotated to manual, aperture adjusted so the exposure indicator showed optimal exposure values other than f5.6. Fantastic. Brilliant news, Becky. It solved someone's problem. But also, you can release another firmware update for G500 as well. It's version 1.31, and they fixed the following issues. Uh, <laughs> they fixed an issue that would, when pictures were taken with a flash unit attached, sometimes result in the flash not performing in mm. accordance with the value selected mm -hmm. under ISO sensitivity settings, maximum sensitivity with flash. That was also in specific operations when one had loaded settings from a saved card or when switching photo banks using the photo shooting menu bank. There's also warning that comes with this firmware. What does it say, Becky? It says performing a firmware update while the camera is affected with this issue will not in itself correct the problem. So after you perform the firmware update, you will still need to either reset all your settings using reset all settings under the setup menu in that one, or you'll have to reload previously saved data from your memory card. So just bear that in mind if you're having that issue with the flash. Wow, hands fools. But you've mentioned some flash guns and also Profoto released a new firmware update for their unique and specific products. According to this, new firmware updates are now available for A1, A1X, A10, A8, and a bunch of other letters and numbers that I don't understand. But what they do is they improve Nikon TTL algorithm. And according to people on the forums and comment sections, they say that they definitely notice an improvement. So if you've got a pro photo flash and you're using video Nikon cameras, you definitely want to get this firmware update. Yes. Next up, new Nikon Z72 and Z62 kits with the Nikon 2420 F4S will now be available also in Hong Kong. We talked about this a couple of yes. weeks ago, didn't we? Yes, and that was with regards to India. So they're also available in Hong Kong now. Now, what I did is I went further and I did my investigative journalism. So what I did is I spent half an hour looking for Hong Kong dealers. Mm. And then I remember Digital Rev. Remember mm -hmm. Kai from Digital Rev? Yes. So he's on his own now. But Digital Rev has those kits listed on their website. And basically, looking at the prices... The price difference is about £1,000 when you buy it together. So, and the price of 24 to 124 in UK is £1,100. So, you're saving about £100 by buying it together. I thought it would be a bigger saving. And remember, with the D850 kit and D780 kit and 24 to 124 G lens, it was about, I think, 250 or £300 saving. So, yes. it's not that big. But saving is a saving, isn't it? Saving is a saving. Every little help. We all like a saving. Can I use my coupons for purchase of this Z9, please? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the Tesco Club card points. That's right. And your Waitrose points. Oh, yes. Next up, Nikon announced the 50 finalist films of their film festival in its 12th edition. You can actually see the finalists in the YouTube video that we'll include in the description box. But just a little disclaimer, it's in French. So if your French is a bit rusty, just bear with us. Absolutely. And it's good that actually the film finalists being shown on the website that actually you can see videos on. So, yes. you know, it's very good, I think. Makes sense. Speaking of YouTube videos and a bit of Z9 coverage, there is a video from Mani Ortiz, and it's called Why I Switched to Nikon Z9 for 30 Days, the pros and cons compared to Sony A1 and Canon R3. Now, this is, may not be interesting to a Nikon user base, but people coming from other brands would be interesting to see and see the comparison. Maybe if you've got Canon, you've got Sony, and you want to know how Nikon behaves compared to those cameras, this is going to be a good video to watch. Yeah, and send all your friends that use Sony and Canon over to that video. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. 
right. and send them to us. And then send them to us afterwards. Absolutely. Now, in anticipation of the 800mm PF lens, Matt Irwin, friend of the show, is trying out some F-mount PF lenses just to kind of get a feel for them. So his most recent video is the Nikon 300 F4 PF at night handheld. And he says, small, light, useful. So go and check that out when you have a moment on his YouTube channel. We'll include a link in the description. Absolutely. And then also we can kind of expect the performance of 800 mil based on 300 mil PF and 500 mil PF, isn't it? So, so what we think is we, we can definitely have a look at the rendering of 300 and 500 PF lenses, so face Fresnel lenses. And that should give us an idea about the rendering of the new 800 mil. And also a lot of people say that actually 800 mil will be the size of 500 PF, which is... If it would be the case, that would be amazing. It would be very exciting indeed. Now, you've seen the 400 mil in a flash yesterday back here. What's your impression so far? Very, very light. I honestly was expecting it to be much heavier when I picked it up. It is, although I picked it up with the lens hood on, it is about the size of the 500 PF, mm -hmm. but it's at least half the weight, I think. Yeah, so it's, it definitely looks chunky, especially yeah. the front diameter looks quite large. But then when you lift it, because I was kind of preparing my body to, you know, for it to be heavy. And then when I got in my hand, my hand just went up because I didn't expect it to be so light. Bracing yourself, yeah. like brace and then whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nearly took off that lens when you took it. <laughs> Absolutely. And then this is technically a pre-production model. But what we hear that they're finally starting to come into the country, or at least we'll be coming soon, isn't it? I think we should hopefully start seeing them very soon from what I understand. Dude, they're going to be in very, very limited supply, as as many things are at the moment. So if you do have one on pre-order, please be patient. If you haven't pre-ordered yours yet, then just be aware that they won't be a sort of on-the-shelf item for quite a while. Buckle up and fasten your seatbelts. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, that's it on the Nikon news. Let's move on to the third-party news. Now we have a bunch of third-party lenses coming in. I think we mentioned about seven or eight lenses last time. Yeah. I have another five or six lenses to talk about. They're coming in thick and fast. Absolutely. Yeah. First up, we have the Yongnyo YN 85mm f1.8 Z DF DSM lens for Nikon Z mount, which has been officially announced. Now, this is a lens with a stepping motor so it uses a similar technology to the Nikon Z lenses anyway mm. it's an 85 1.8 shoots f16 at the smallest aperture comes with nine elements in eight groups and the weight is just 405 grams which is very interesting and also you can update the firmware update via USB-C port now the first review of this lens is out it's by Richard Warren on his YouTube channel and he basically said this lens is very similar to performance of Viltrox lens, so H5 1.8. Remember, Richard has a review on that one. The main difference is actually the lens is weather sealed itself. Viltrox is not. So if you want a weather sealed lens, then the choice is yours. Obviously, there's also a new conversion of H5 1.8S, which will be superior to this too. Very nice. There is also an Irix 21mm f1.4 full frame DSLR lens coming for the Nikon F mount. Now, we haven't obviously had much love for the Nikon F mount recently from third party manufacturers, so it's nice to see someone making one. This is a wide angle, so 89.7 degree field of view. Mm, chunky. That's right. Well, it is a manual focus lens, so be prepared for that. It's got a connectors to tell the camera what lens it is, so your EXIF data is going to be safe. And it's going to be out soon. Now, we're also going to talk about a couple of senior lenses that are coming to that mount as well. The first one up is Venus Optics' uh, new Laova lens. It's 75 millimeter T2.9. Remember the video lenses? They measure them in Ts instead of Fs. Mm -hmm. But they're quite similar to that. And it, apparently, it will have zero distortion, weight 610 grams, and cost $700. And there's also going to be Shirui 75T 2.9 1.6 X full frame lens as well. Now, this one is going to be funded through Indiegogo, which is very similar to Kickstarter website. So, mm -hmm. again, we all can have different attitudes towards Kickstarter projects, etc. So, but it is there. So, if you want one, if you feel comfortable purchasing the lens this way, then you can head on to their website and uh, do your pledge. Excellent. Last but not least, we have the Lens Baby, who've announced a fixed body soft focus. 50 optic lens. Do you reckon it's going to be the sharpest lens of them all? <laughs> I reckon that considering it says soft focus on it, that it's probably not the sharpest lens in the world. Lens Baby, for those who aren't aware, are known for their kind of special effects lenses. They are relatively cheap and cheerful, but they're kind of for creative effects. You just release your creativity when if you use lens baby. If you're an artist, <laughs> you know when, you, when people come to the shop and say, I'm an artist. Yeah. 
and then you're like, uh, I don't know what equipment to offer them. <laughs> Maybe don't say that. <laughs> is it G3500 or is it Z9? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which way do we go? Let's move on to software news. DxO released a pure raw 2 software. Apparently there's a bunch of improvements there. First of all, speed improvements there. There's 40 new cameras. 5,800 new models and improved operating system integration. The new version will also allow users to pre-process images without leaving Lightroom, which is... I think that's the main improvement, isn't it? That's the primary improvement, yep. <laughs> I think the problem there with using plugins with the Lightroom, when you need to open your raw file in different software, you effectively have to convert your raw file into the TIFF. Mm. And some people don't want to do that. No. So yeah, having that integration is quite useful, I would say. I agree. Now, Skylum, who are located in Ukraine, actually, released Luminar Neo 1.0.2. So some of the new improvements on that are that the copy and paste edits functionality have been improved. Image 3D Transform, PNG format support, which is useful for, for certain creators. Increased frame per second rate while using the drag slider on any of the effects and more. So there's small updates, but all of them just overall improve the user experience, I would say. Speaking of photographic software companies that are based in Ukraine, there's also well-known software called Helicon Soft Stack Software that's been used before Nikon had an integrated stack software in their cameras. Mm -hmm. They're also based in Ukraine. So if you want to help uh, those developers directly, this is one way to do that. Exactly. Supporting them by buying the software or updating it, paying for upgrades, etc., is all good stuff. Absolutely. And now... Now for the big news of the week. That is the main topic of this podcast. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to uh, share this with you. Uh, it's film news. So Kodak Gold 200 is coming to medium format in April. Aren't you happy? <laughs> so Kodak have finally announced the re-release of its popular consumer grade Kodak Gold 200 color negative film in 120 format, which is available right now for stores to purchase in five pack. Pro packs. It's pretty good. Mm. Apparently, it should be 25% cheaper than Kodak Acta and Kodak Portrait Film, so which have raised in price for about 25%. So effectively, if you think about price of Portrait of the last year, that will be price of Kodak Gold right now. So we're looking at £45 RRP right. instead of something like 60 65 for Portrait. Yeah. And that's for five packs. So effectively, you get five rolls of film. And yeah, it's either 50 shots on 6x7 or more if you should in a slightly smaller format. What do you think, Bex? Are you excited? Have you pre-ordered some? I haven't pre-ordered some because I'm quite well stocked with Portra 160 in 120. But maybe, maybe I'll buy some. It depends. I know there's going to be a little bit of a wait probably to get supply as well. There usually is. Yes. According to Analog Wonderland, they will be coming about two to three weeks time. Right. And then also, obviously, if you know Code of Gold, it's a consumer film. So exactly, it's not... It's not called professional, it's not called portrait, but at the same time, it's quite well known and well loved. And if you want to have this effect on your medium form of camera, then it's definitely a good way to do. It is a big announcement because I think it is one of the first announcements we are releasing film mm. in several years, isn't it? Yeah, it's been four years since the release of Kodak T-Max P3200 film and about three and a half years since the announcement of Ektachrome 100. So here you go. The film is dying. What? <laughs> well, that's what they say, isn't it? They say film is dying. You know, how wrong can they be? Absolutely. Obviously, if you want to get your code of gold on 35 millimeter, you have to wait for six months. And some people complain about that nine deliveries. <laughs> but that's not all. Cine Steel on the same day announced a new 400 ISO film as well, which is called CineSteel 400D, which is either called Dynamic or Daylight. This will actually be released in both 35mm and 120 formats. It is a fine grain film that delivers a soft color palette with natural saturated color and rich warm skin tones. The film has a wide dynamic range with a base sensitivity of ISO 400, but can be rated from 200 to 800 uh, and can actually be pushed up to 3,200. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Shooting color film at 3,200 ISO, it's quite a difficult thing to do. I don't know, have you ever pushed color film to 3,200? I only did black and white. No, I haven't. Same, I've only done black and white as well. But I know that some films work better when they're pushed a little bit. Um, so it's interesting that that's part of the promotion of this one is that you can do that. Absolutely. Now, looking at Cinesti 800T, which effectively buys a Kodak Vision 500 film mm. and remove the ramjet and then package them 
into the 35 mil rolls. So do you think that 400D will have a code of film or do you think it's been developed? I looked at their website. I couldn't find any information there. So I don't know. Maybe there's more to come on that. Yeah, usually this kind of information comes out a little while after the release of the film. I mean, Cine still didn't actually promote that they were using Kodak cinematic film mm -hmm. originally in their 800T. I think that that sort of leaked out from somewhere much later on. So might be the same case with this one. But also there are a lot of companies developing film now. I've That's noticed true. that we're seeing more and more film development. So who knows? I'm glad that they've added another sensitivity to their lineup. Absolutely. They now have ISO 50 film. They have uh, black and white is what, 200, I think. Yep. Yeah. Then we have now 400 and we have 800 film. The, the funny thing is they also hope to develop 400D film in 5x4 large format. Yeah. Currently, you can get Fuji and Kodak films with that. So it would be nice to have. Now, the sample shots look very interesting. I do like the tones, as they call them. So mm -hmm. uh, they do look lovely. And you can pre-purchase the film for shipping in April in a similar Kickstarter campaign, but through CineSteel website. Now, in this case, I trust CineSteel. They've been a while, so I don't think they'll run away with my $70. <laughs> but yeah, you can definitely do it there. And the first shipment is coming out in April with the further shipment being released in July. But that's not all. We also have a German manufacturer, Adox, announced the development of new ISO 200 film, which is called Color Mission. Wow. So the first batch can actually be purchased today as it was produced some time ago. Unfortunately, the company that coated the film went bankrupt shortly after the first run and has been cold stored for several years. Um, the profits of the sale of the first batch will be directed back into film research and the next batch is expected to take something like four years. Absolutely. So if you want to have a taste and then wait for, for four years <laughs> for the new color film to come in, that's going to be the way to do it. But as you notice, three new color films mm. have been announced. And that's uh, the two came in literally a couple of days ago and the Alex announced it uh, about four weeks ago. So that's really interesting. Before we only saw lots of black and white new films and they were genuinely repackaged films like the Codex or Ilford films. Mm. So those are kind of genuinely new films coming in. I love it. I, I, I personally love it. I've ordered, I've pre ordered gold. I'm looking into Cine Steel. The only problem with Cine Steel is it's paying the duties and taxes. So suddenly yeah. $75 becomes 120 pounds. And then, you know, so <laughs> it's an expensive hobby. That's for sure. That's true. And I think Forza Impex, which is German photographic dealers, they're the main distributors of Cine Steel in uh, Europe and UK as well. So I think maybe for us, that would be the way to do that. Probably. We'll still have to pay some duties, though, because Brexit. That's true. That's true. But that's not all. No, no there's, that's it. That's that, it. That's all on the film news. Next up are your reviews. So the 100 to 400 has been reviewed by Petapixel. Their brief summation of it is stellar optics and speed. They praise the image quality, AF speed and build and criticize the OLED screen not being particularly useful. Yeah. What are your thoughts on OLED on Z lenses? Do, do you find them useful at all? The reason why I'm asking is I never found it either useful or destruction at the same time. I never had a problem or took issue with it, so I wouldn't call it like a, a downside to a lens, but I can understand if they think that it's not particularly useful. It's, but you're not paying for the OLED screen in that lens, are you? You sure? <laughs> <laughs> no. Are you sure about that? You're paying uh, for the quality of the lens and the reach and the fact that there isn't another lens in the Z lineup that covers that range yet. That's true. I have a feature request, actually. I would like those OLED screens to show the time, like my little Casio watch. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure they can arrange that. So, I mean, we've had a little play with 100 to 400. We haven't been able to spend enough time with one to do a full review review video but we have had a go with it and uh so far liked what i see yeah i mean for the money mm. it's fantastic and it's definitely beats all the h2400 lenses in f mount mm. it's just super fast the image quality is fantastic yes you can get better lens but at 10,000 plus so a two and a half is a it's good value for money exactly f stuff has also published a review on the 28 and 40 mil lenses this review is called the two of my favorite nikon z lenses are also the least expensive now we did a review video a few weeks back didn't we One, yes. wandering on buckingham palace the author of the review christopher malcolm has this to say. Convenience isn't the type of thing that can be measured with a lab result, but it is the type of thing that will ultimately determine how often a product gets used. And with the 28-40mm combo easily being my second most used lens setup, 
and my primary setup for fun personal work, it's hard to argue, even at their smaller price tags, that these two lenses aren't two of the most valuable lenses in my kit. At a bare minimum, they are two of my favorites. So if you'd like to see the full review, please head over to the link that we will pop in the description box for you. Now I have a question for you to ask. He said that convenience isn't the type of thing that can be measured with a lab result. Now, I want to ask you and our viewers, what do you think about lab tests of the lenses? Or do you look more into the lenses, how they feel in your hands, what image quality you get, the rendering, over the sharpness and clinical, let's say over the performance of the lens? What are your thoughts on that? This is a really great question, actually, because when I'm buying a lens, I tend to actually look at convenience and price tag over results. Obviously, I won't buy a lens that's had terrible reviews. Yeah. But um, when it comes to Nikon Z lenses, there, there aren't any terrible lenses, yeah. really. So it comes down to size, convenience, how much use I'm going to get out of it. I would be interested to know what our viewers think, though, because we've been looking at trying to sort of do a set piece on reviews when we review lenses. What we tend to end up doing is we get a lens for a very short period of time. We do a shoot with it so that we can have some real life experience rather than putting it on a lab bench and taking pictures of a focusing chart. And that's we draw our conclusions based on field use. Yes, real life shots that we look at that were taken by us. As a review, do you enjoy brick wall shots? I don't personally, but I, I do see that people enjoy those things and that they want us to take pictures of brick walls. So we'd be interested to hear your thoughts. If you'd like a clinical lab review video from us on occasion when we can do that, then we can certainly provide. Whereas if you like our out and about field test reviews, then we'll keep on doing those. As a photographer, do you think you are better than just taking a brick wall shots? I think that I won't decide whether a lens is good for me or not by the picture of a brick wall. That's not the picture that's going to decide whether a lens should be mine. Exactly. That's how I feel exactly. Mm -hmm. Or on the same page. That's that's why this works. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to We Can Read and Watch. We have an interesting one. It's called Z9, an automotive and lifestyle photography with Emmy Shaw and Richie Scherer. Your next We Can Read and Watch recommendation was actually sent to us very kindly by Glenn Arnold. So thank you very much for this, Glenn. Thank you. Um, he pointed us in the direction of an article on Petapixel, which says photographers 3,200 undeveloped film roles hold the history of rock and roll. Now, rock and roll. That's, that's right. To quote from Vahan, our good friend, photographer Charles Daniels has been photographing famous rockers like Rod Stewart, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Pete Townsend, Aerosmith, Steve Tyler, and others since the late 1960s. Now, he actually shot with Nikon. He was apparently known as Two Nikon Charlie to his friends back in the day uh, and shot with an F3 as well as an F5 and... I think at the time, during the actual time, he shot with an FTN. Mm. So he has thousands of rolls of film, quite literally, and he's opened up a GoFundMe and has actually raised something on the order of, I don't know, $40,000 or something. Mm -hmm. Because this film is so old, it actually needs specialist care to be developed. Uh, yeah. Go and check out the link. Have a look at the thousands of rolls of film well, that he's Like I heard you can develop your film. Oh, Do you yeah. Want to give a hand? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not for this. Um, but anyway, do check it out because it's a very, very interesting article to read. And also it's got a little bit of history sliced in there as well as him being a Nikon man through and through. Absolutely. Well, 3,200 rolls is a lot of rolls, I can tell you. I've just shot six rolls of film on my brief holiday in Portugal. And uh, I can tell you that... That was a lot of photo photographs. So a lot of photographs. Absolutely. Imagine scanning 3,200 shots. This is why he needs the GoFundMe page, because who's who's yeah. got the ability to do that? And it does need to be done professionally. So do go and have a read if you have a moment this weekend. Absolutely. And that's a wrap. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yes. Thank you very much for watching and or listening. We are aiming to get to 20,000 subscribers this year. So if you haven't subscribed, please do. Please do give the show a like. We'd very much appreciate that. And if you're listening on a podcast platform, you can also give us a follow, leave us a review and a rating. It all helps, truly. Absolutely. We'll be greatly appreciated. And if you want to find us on all social medias of the world, you can find Becky at... I'm at Rebecca underscore Denazi, And you're at... Also on Instagram at Konstin Kochkin. There you go. Fantastic. And scheduling resumes in normal. We will see you on Friday. We will for another live stream. Join us there. It's actually our two-year anniversary of doing the Grey's Westminster live stream, believe it or not. So do come and join us for a very special two-year anniversary stream on Friday afternoon. Are we going to have a cake? 
We should have cake. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> cake, champagne, funny hats. The, the works. Balloons, everything, isn't it? <laughs> Streamers. We should do all that. Absolutely. Come join us this Friday and we'll see you soon. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.